Um, I always looked at the future and, and looked at how I could step in into an industry or into a sector that wasn't really being developed or served well and, and, and doing something different. So for me it was more about can we service a need in a, in a specific area that uh, nobody was servicing. And when we first started in the development, you know, we were doing mid-rise buildings and uh, most of the smaller custom home builders weren't in the mid-rise space and most of the high-rise builders weren't in the mid-rise space. So there was a vacuum that we were filling. So we always look at sort of niche markets and, and where we could um, come in and, and do something unique that really nobody's uh, doing. And uh, in anything that we do, that's what we look at. Definitely my family, um, my father. Um, a lot of business acumen comes from my father, a lot comes from my mother. Uh, but it was a combination of the two, of, um, of what to do and of what not to do. And um, uh, I would say it was, it, was, it was definitely my mother and father, uh, as well as um, friends and those you associate yourself with as you grow up. And uh, a lot of that influence comes from uh, your community and, and uh, your, your own personal circles. I think, the, you know, I think the secret to it is knowing the hidden needs of the person. Um, in, in most of the, I'd say, most successful negotiations, um, it's not what's apparent, it's what's not apparent. And the hidden needs are probably the key success factor to identify because uh, they're not identifiable so easily. And once you identify what really the person's hidden needs are and what problem they're really solving for, and then you address that, you're gonna gain success in whatever you're negotiating because it becomes a win-win. Uh, but most, you know, in most negotiations, when they, I think when they don't go well or they fail, it's you haven't addressed the hidden need. And uh, so, you know, for me, the secret sauce has always been identify what that hidden need is in whatever the off-assembly negotiation is or anything that I'm doing. And, uh, and if you address that, um, the rest of it comes together really beautifully. It, it, I think the way you can get people to believe in your vision is, are you going to take them to a better place? The, the key factor in any leader or any leadership or anybody who's going to do anything that's visionary is, are you going to take the people around you and your community and your city and your country to a better place? And uh, it's very easy buy-in uh, from everybody around you if, if you have a roadmap to do that and they believe in that, um, then you, you build a great team and, and you're able to do things that most people aren't able to do or, or thought were impossible to do only because of the fact that you know they see the vision that you're going to actually do something that's going to make life better for everybody including the team that's with you. The Swiss rebuilding in London without a question in the UK uh, which also uh, Foster did uh, and, and was the architecture. Uh, I would say um, you look at um, the buildings in New York and Manhattan, um, uh, like 432 Park Avenue, for example, uh, that just uh, was completed uh, a few years ago. Um, I look at sort of what individual buildings are around the world that are unique and, and stand you know, clear of um, what's formula built. And, uh, and those are like the one. The one isn't a formula built building. It's a very unique, one of a kind building that uh, for Canada, you know, is um, uh, something that's on the same scale as CN Tower in terms of, uh, you know, putting Canada on the architectural map. We haven't really done anything of that scale since the CN Tower, since 1977. And so uh, I look at that and I look at buildings around the world and that inspired me on the one, was to put Toronto, again, architecturally back um, to be in the same realm of other international cities. It's a unified voice. The one was created and the architecture came after almost two years of planning with the City of Toronto and the community and uh, many stakeholders. So 
what we see in the one is the voice of Toronto because we spent two years with it, with the city, um, uh, really planning uh, what this building was going to look like and what it would become. And there was many evolutions to the building for us to get to the final design and, and what we see now. And um, the one stands for Toronto and for Canada. Uh, and we're quite proud of it, and the city's quite proud of it. Uh, everything from acquiring the site and actually assembling the site was a challenge because you had over 14 you know, different people to assemble a site that was not for sale um, to the zoning, to the um, uh, approvals, to the you know, financial engineering of a project of this magnitude. Uh, you know, the one is now at uh, approximately $1.5 billion. Uh, and so it's, uh, you know, for a single tower, it's, it's uh, never been done before in Canada. So there were many aspects to it that uh, were incredible challenges. And those incredible challenges is what made it successful. Um, there is no success of magnitude that doesn't come with, ex with extreme challenges. And I think if you don't have challenges, uh, the magnitude of the success is, is really equal to those challenges. So I'm, in a way, I'm happy I had the challenges because it allowed the building to be what it is and it also allowed us to uh, move boundaries in ways that, you know, for Canada had never been moved from a financial engineering standpoint, from a zoning standpoint, from official plan standpoint, and, to, uh, and, 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 and in luxury standpoint to create a luxury building of this uh, scale had never been done before either. So it's, uh, it allows you to do and move boundaries, which are great. They were the ones of industry. We, we picked them out because they were the ones in their industry. They were the superstars in um, each one of the sectors and each one of the relevant scopes of work that we needed. So, you know, we look at Foster and Partners out of the UK and, you know, I would say they're, you know, uh, one of the top architectural firms internationally in the world who were able to uh, envision and be able to um, put to paper the vision that we had for the one and for the city and for the Toronto and to be able to structurally uh, build such a building you know having uh, the structural engineers we had with RGC and so forth to actually do something at this um, caliber was again they were the ones in the industry and every consulting firm and every partner that we um, uh, collaborated with were really the superstars in their own industry and as a you know I kind of looked at myself as a conductor where I was bringing in the best you know percussionists the best drummers the best violinists the best celloists in each area and bringing them together and having you know knowing how that would fit together in concert together and, and we did that. Definitely my father and my mother without a question uh, I admired my mother and father's um, essentially their courage to be able to leave Iran and, and start a new life in Canada, not speaking the language and coming here as immigrants and starting over again um, with a family, with a young family. And, uh, and I think uh, I look at that now as a father and, and as a family person and, and uh, being my father's age when he came and thinking about you know, the courage it takes to do that. But uh, he was definitely a both my mother and father were great mentors and, and role models for me growing up, um, and uh, along with, uh, again, the community that I was with. You know, I, I look at myself as an entrepreneur, uh, but my canvas for the entrepreneurship is my buildings. So there's many different canvases for many different artists, but um, I, you know, I look at myself as an entrepreneur because that's my passion, that's what I love, and that my DNA is that. Uh, but I express that entrepreneurship through um, the developments and through the uh, designs and uh, and we've done that with every business, you know, whether it was this business and this development or my prior companies. Sure, I mean, this was a mining site in terms of what we were doing on, on, on a level because we uh, went down to 163 feet. And uh, we had our first, I think, bedrock hit at 136 feet, uh, which is basically uh, mining. And to you know excavate and to shore a site and to hit bedrock uh, at those depths uh, and do soil removal. And we're talking about at the corner of Young and Bloor, and to 
you know, build four levels of underground parking and, and going down that uh, road, you know, with a subway platform and having the Young Blue subway station there and then also having an 85 plus story building on top of it. Um, the engineering and the geotech was that of mining and to be able to, uh, you know, drop concrete trucks in and pick them up and to bring concrete down and excavate. Uh, we used a lot of the uh, similar technologies in mining in order to operate and do it, except uh, in a mining, you have so much more room and collateral room and, and, and real estate around you to be able to do it because you're usually out, you know, uh, in spaces that are much more vast. We had a very tight 32,000 square foot floor plate that, you know, we had to work with. And you know, this is a, an aspirational living building. It's, it really aspires you to, um, to, to really you know, want the best in everything with no compromise. So this is really, you know, the individuals who are purchasing and are living in this build, building really have no compromise uh, in, when it comes down to quality and luxury and, and what they're uh, looking for. So um, every purchaser, I can tell you, that has purchased here is um, uh, the, the, the DNA or I'd say the makeup of them are um, no compromise people who are looking for the best of the best and, uh, and appreciate the details uh, that, and the passion that goes into those details into a building like that. And that's, what we, that's who we serve, right, in this building. Magnificent. I, I'm extremely blessed to, and very fortunate and incredibly grateful to have um, the internal team that I have. We couldn't have done it without the internal team and uh, every single person that's involved in the internal team is paramount to making the build, building and the business successful. And um, I couldn't be more grateful to have the team that I had from day one. Uh, and as the team evolves and, and, and grew, um, uh, they were, you know, they are all the most passionate and the most incredibly uh, wise uh, people that I've seen. And, uh, and bringing all of them in concert together, um, it creates magic and uh, buildings like this don't get uh, built without that. Delivering on our promises is the most important thing to me and uh, exceeding expectations. Exceeding expectations and um, having it seen and known for uh, building buildings that are that made people's lives much better, made the city much better and the community much better um, and, and creating a, uh, an art through those buildings for the country and the city that has inspired others to do similar types of developments. It's my home. Um, Toronto's given me so much and given me the ability to do what I do. Um, the city, the people, the country is, uh, I think, you know, one of the best in the world, if not the best. And I couldn't be more proud um, to have, you know, grown up here and raised my family here and, uh, and to be able to contribute back to the city and to the community uh, in a way that the city has given back to me. And so for me, uh, personally, it was to build something for the city that would uh, amplify its greatness to the world, at least on the architectural uh, stage, uh, because on so many other stages we have done that. And Toronto is uh, truly an international city and it deserved to have an architecture of like the one, uh, along with all the other great attributes that Toronto has. Every day is a better day uh, than yesterday. So I look at every day is better than yesterday. So I jump out of bed. I, I re-energize with my family um, by just spending time with them and, um, and what I call one-on-one -on -one time with either my wife or my son or my daughter and that re-energizes me. Um, and then I have, you know, my passion of flying. So, uh, you know, for me, every time I fly, I, it, it re-energizes and uh, uh, recharges my batteries and, uh, and 
it's a it's a passion that's uh, worked for me for you know over 30 years. Cool. What type of flying? Um, planes, <laughs> airplanes, fixed wing aircraft. Yeah. Like helicopters now more. Uh, uh, fixed wing, oh, uh, jets okay. and planes and nice. yeah. It is incredibly busy. Um, what I'd say, um, uh, incredibly well programmed. Uh, there is, we live life, and 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 everybody from my son, my daughter, my wife, myself, and then individually and united, um, looks at uh, every day filling uh, the hours in ways that um, really make you in, in, enjoy and 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 experience life. So it's pretty programmed. Do they understand the gravitas of what you're building? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Because I share it with them all the time at dinner table conversations, and so yeah, <laughs> they hear me on the in the car. They hear me on phone calls. They hear me on uh, you know they, you're you're they're absorbed in it since they were born. Nice. So uh, yeah, they they understand it uh, maybe better than I do at times. <laughs> self-made entrepreneurs, um, uh, people that have uh, overcome great challenges, great struggles. Um, I, I love all sorts of um, different people, uh, but the ones who I naturally gravitate towards are those who have uh, defied the odds. And uh, you know, where Naysayer says they, you know, they weren't gonna make it and, and they achieve great things. I don't listen to it. Oh, great. I, I uh, you know, you, if you're going to do great things, anybody that does great things will have negative press. Uh, I don't think you can put yourself into the arena and not expect to have negative press because it's it's the blessing and the curse. So every time you're going to do something great, there will be a naysayer and there will be negativity to challenge that and to have it stand up to debate. And I think that you need that to actually have the mirror to be able to see whether you are passionate and you are doing the right thing. So I look at the negative press as a reflection, am I, am I on the right course? And am I, you know, and it, it gives you the determination to punch through a lot of um, struggles and a lot of what I call obstacles that are naturally put in the way in order for you not to achieve um, what your goals are. And I think the whole world's just designed that way. I don't think it's an individual thing. I think that's just the universe. Yeah. And so I don't look at uh, negative press uh, in a way that it's a, it's a uh, setback. I look at it as a setup to actually propel you forward in a much more um, uh, constructive way. I love what I do. And I never give up. where I've done something that gives me joy and I'm experiencing joy, um, which you can't experience unless you have others with you. It's not singular. That's the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness I can do on my own. I can be happy on my own, but joy I can only experience with someone else. So an ideal vacation for me is to experience joy. Mm. Uh, Toronto, I have so many. Some of the top restaurants I love in Toronto. Um, uh, but uh, if I was, you know, Saison in San Francisco is one of uh, my favorites um, uh, that I, you know, that I can think of. Uh, but there's, you know, so many great restaurants uh, all around. Do you around want to give a shout out in Toronto? Of course, in Toronto, Soto Soto is one of my favorites. Yosos is one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> Very fitting that they're across the street. <laughs> they, you know what? It, it's it, it it it's actually funny because. All of them I went to even before I was oh, wow. working across the street. So uh, Yosos and Soto Soto I went to from the time you know I was a teenager. And uh, so the memories and the food and growing up with that and, and uh, seeing the same faces and familiarity is what you know, has driven it. And ironically I then come and I build right across the street from my favorite restaurants and, yeah. and community. It, it makes it easier. Um, wake up, um, see my family, say good morning, uh, share the morning together and uh, get shower changed and 
looking forward to jumping into the day. I actually don't drink coffee. No. No. How do you do I don't drink coffee. coffee. <laughs> I don't drink know? coffee. Wow, what do you yeah. drink? What water. I, I drink a lot of water, still too. Uh, I drink a lot of water. I love water, and I actually don't drink coffee. I mean, I'll have I'll have a macchiato, you know, after dinner or something like that here and then. But yeah, I don't I don't drink coffee through the day. So at you've all. never been a coffee drinker? Never, never. I mean, I have it like I'll have a coffee at dinner or something. If I'm out at a restaurant, a nice Italian restaurant or something, I'll have a macchiato. But that's about it. Making the lives of everybody around you happy and better. By default, if you do that, you've got the sweetest life in the world. I'm very, very grateful um, to be able to do what I do. And uh, it's, uh, and you know, when we complete this building and it's, and it's completed, it's, uh, it's a great honor for me to have been able to do it and, and to do it. So I'm, I'm just very grateful to the city. I'm very grateful to everybody around me. I'm grateful to the support. And I'm even grateful for the challenges that I had, because I think without even those challenges, we wouldn't have been able to push um, the boundaries the way we have in order to be able to succeed. And, uh, and so I look at everything and I'm just extremely grateful.